it was, I think, around the 4th of March 1985 that I walked into an office which, in Tim, which was, Tim was sitting at the other desk. And uh, the technology that I had to work with, th this was at the start of a thing called the Australian Science Archives Project. I had a filing cabinet, I had a desk, I had a telephone, I had an IBM electric golf ball typewriter, and I had some <coughs> coloured texture colours and some files, and that was, that was the technology that we had. Um, <coughs> there was some centralised word processing, and there was some other sort of centralised database stuff and Tim was actually working on a database project on a uh, register of physics instruments in sort of collections around Australia. I think we're still trying to figure out whether we can find that data and resurrect it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but in uh, 1987 um, I got uh, one of the first IBM PCs in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science and the first piece of database technology, or the first piece of technology I bought was not a word processing system, it was actually a database, a relational database system. So my background uh, prior to that was that I'd done some work on uh, PDP 1170 uh, in using Fortran, and that was as a composition student, not as a computer programmer. So, uh, and I was actually doing, just mucking around at La Trobe University uh, looking at digital synthesis, but then I got onto um, doing some programming, looking at computer-aided composition. And, uh, but to make money, I started working as an archivist at the University of Melbourne Archives, and so that began this journey which has sort of led me to, to be here today. Tim and I uh, ended up working together on the Science Archives project for quite some time before he went off to finish writing his, um, uh, his PhD. But what he did in the, in, the, in the process of that story, I mean, I, I was running the Science Archives project as an archivist, but what Tim was doing was actually looking at the technologies that were emerging at the time, particularly in relation to the web. And so what we were able to do was to take data that we were collecting in a highly structured way and get it out onto the web in sort of 93, 94. And, you know, we were one of the first sort of science archives, archives, um, organisations in the world to do that, to actually be getting data out in a structured way. And what Tim's done is just run at an incredibly fast speed, you know, with some of those ideas. So um, I just want to acknowledge Tim. And I, and I feel like I'm just struggling to keep up. But I suppose what I've been trying to do up on the other side of the coin is look at um, how he makes sure stuff is actually preservable. So then that, in a sense, becomes the scholarship part of the equation. It's really saying, OK, researchers do fantastic stuff. We've got some good tools. But how are we actually going to make that uh, some sort of, there be some sort of sustainable foundation so others in the future can work on that? And that gets to the, the exit strategy, the idea, the fact that the knowledge that people are creating and the work that they're doing is stuff that scholars in the past have built on. And this is that we want to be continually building those sorts of foundations. The project I, I want to talk a bit about today is the Finally Connect project, and I don't have any slides. I'm going to try and do this all on the web. And at the end of it, I just want to have a, a bit of an explore of some of the network visualisations we're doing to help us try and understand what it is we're doing in this project. Tim spoke, um, and I don't have any, any notes for this at all. I'm just making this up as I go along. So it's so an evolving story. And I'll try and draw on some of the things that have been mentioned so far. Tim has spoken a lot about the National Archives. And um, I stand before you today a very disappointed and quite angry person because I heard yesterday, I mean, what Tim has shown is when the National Archives preserves something, what you can do with it. What I heard yesterday was that the National Archives Tasmanian branch has just destroyed a whole lot of records about forgotten Australians' case files. Uh, we were f I was fortunate through sort of the networks that exist in our, in our world that I was asked to join a project called the Who Am I Project, which was um, being initiated by Professor Cathy Humphreys and Shirley Swain. Cathy Humphreys is a social worker and Shirley Swain is a historian of sort of family welfare in Australia and has been for about 35 years. Not a particularly popular area of historical research, you know, not one that would get top billing at uh, any sort of conference. Uh, and Cathy, as a social worker, was particularly interested in what was going on with family violence, out-of-home care, kids who were being in care, and the way that they were struggling to re-establish their identities, um, both what is happening now in current practice, but also what has happened in the past as a result of government policy in relation to 
you know, kids being orphanages, uh, going into orphanages, becoming wards of the state and that sort of thing. We got a, an ARC um, linkage project uh, in 2009, or started in 2009, called Who Am I Project. And it was, uh, I don't know how well Cathy had engineered this, but it was entirely fortuitous that we were able to, because of the technologies we had, which Tim was instrumental in helping us build back in the, back in the 90s, um, we were able to actually start that project, go online, collect a whole of data, and actually have a public knowledge space which was mapping out-of-home care in Victoria uh, from 1840 to the present day within the first year of the project. And because we had that technology, we, we had a public knowledge space out there. And what it meant was that community, rather than um, working against one another, actually was sharing a, a much richer knowledge of the problems that collectively government and individuals and communities were facing in trying to deal with this issue of reclaiming knowledge about uh, the time that these people uh, had been wards of the state or in orphanages, you know, from that age, of sort of from birth till the age of 18, where typically they had no records personally and they had very little memory, often it had been suppressed. And so people, are, you know, from 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years would be coming back saying, often from pressure from their family saying, why is it that, you know, what happened, you know, wh where are your parents, what happened when you were a kid, what did you do? And they would say, well, I actually re really have no idea. And so this, uh, many of them, and there are 500,000 of these people in Australia, uh, were going back to record sources to try and find records of when they were wards of the state or whatever they might have been. And those records are all over the place. They're not just in government archives, they're in church archives, they're in uh, state libraries, they're in government archives, they're all over the place and it's, a, it's become quite a serious issue. Uh, and there's been a lot of lobbying going on. Um, we were lucky in the sense that we, we were using these sort of digital humanities tools to get out into the public space. It was starting to create coherence where there hadn't been coherence in this community. But also it coincided with the right apology to the forgotten Australians and the former child migrants. And Subsequent, which, uh, subsequent to that, there was, uh, that was in 2009, there was a scoping study done and then there was, uh, uh, there was a budget allocation made and they said, okay, well, what should we do? And they looked at what we've done in Victoria with the Pathways Project and uh, they said, well, we should actually do that for the whole country. And in fact, they looked at what was going on in every other state and territory and said, well, nobody else has done anything like this, so why don't we do it for the whole country? Indeed, they looked internationally and they found that no one else around the world had done anything like what we were doing in Victoria. So we were, I mean, extraordinarily fortunate in that we were able to take some digital humanities technology, some archival sort of technology, and actually get a real budget to see what we could do. Most of the money actually gets spent on historians, a little bit actually gets spent on the technology, but most of it is, is actually running the workshops, uh, funding the historians to be doing the, the research on the ground. And the reason is that the data's, in that sense, the records are, are not readily available. Most of them are, are hidden, are buried in various places within organisations, and so an enormous amount of work just has to be done on the ground to discover where these records are. So we're at, we're at a, another end of the spectrum from where you know, Tim's playing with stuff that's there and we're actually trying to get the stuff there so it, it can actually be used. So the, the website itself is, is made up of, um, I'm not really going to go into the into a, sort of great, sort of the technical side of it, um, but basically what you can see is that it, it's what we've done is go through and register all of the entities that have been known to exist. Um, and what we, what was interesting was um, we were using sort of this, the, the well-known uh, historical and archival sources back in 2009 for the Pathway, Pathways project, and we thought we'd pretty well covered the whole history of out-of-home care in Victoria. The day that we launched, which was 
sort of in November 2009, the first person to get up and ask a question was about an institution in Ballarat that we hadn't registered, and that was actually a mental health institution because <laughs> we thought that was out of scope, but no, actually a lot of people who in care were in those sorts of institutions. And we realised that, I mean, that was absolutely the telling moment because as soon as we got into the community, we got feedback that said, you know, we've got these blinkers on, this is actually a much more interesting complex fabric and, and framework of knowledge and, and history that we're, we're exploring. And that's what's been happening ever since. Except that now, that rather than just doing it in Victoria, we're now doing it across the country. So the process that we're actually using to engage with the community is, I mean, the website is a very important part of it, but it's actually going out to those communities and running workshops and taking them through exercises and actually getting everybody involved in the process. And uh, it's enormously, um, uh, gratifying work to do in many ways because you are actually helping people and helping society, helping communities deal with something that um, has caused, you know, there's been policy in the past that has caused enormous pain and disturbance to, to many, many hundreds of thousands of people's lives and their families, so therefore you moved into millions. And I suppose one of the other things that we found in um, working in this space was that um, you only have to talk about this, this project to sort of like anybody and you'll find that within about two or three links they will know of somebody who has been in an orphanage or a ward of the state or has suffered these sorts of things. So one of the things we were doing in the workshop was actually inviting people to, uh, particularly um, to care leavers, to come and present at the beginning of each workshop. workshop. That had an extraordinarily powerful way of bringing policy makers, people in government, peace and other places, to make them aware that this is an extremely personal activity, it actually influences people's lives and, it, and that was a, another very powerful tool that we used to, to transform the way um, the community was dealing with the issues.